paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. On December the 8th, 1982, Polish farmer Pavel Tuklin snuck up on a 24-year-old woman walking home alone. He pulled out a hammer and hit her in the back of the head again and again. Well, he would attack his victims quite savagely uh, with a hammer, and sometimes he'd, he'd completely obliterate their face. Tuklin dragged the semi-conscious woman behind a wall so he could hide his devious actions. The residents heard the voice of a girl, some moans coming from the bushes. The woman's cries for help went unheeded, and she died from the blows. In all, Tuklin sexually assaulted and battered nine women to death with a hammer, and he seriously injured 11 more. The police called him the Scorpion. At the end, the prosecutor asked him what he would do if he was released. And Pavel replied, well, I'd probably go for another hunt. Tuklin's reign of terror across Poland would span eight years until he was caught in 1983. He then confessed to nine brutal murders and to the attempted murder and sexual assault of 11 more women, making Pavel Tuklin one of the world's most evil killers. in the north of Poland. Between 1975 and 1983, serial killer Pavel Tuklin, armed with a hammer, viciously attacked 20 women in and around the busy port city. Nine of the women were callously killed. All were sexually assaulted in what were harrowing times for the people of Gdansk. It would have been really terrifying being a, a woman in this area of Poland at this particular point in time. There have been all these hammer attacks on women, nine were killed, and this is going on for years, and all the time women have still got to go out to work, shop for groceries, they've still got to be in and around public spaces where they might be at risk. Investigative journalist Krzysztof Wojciech followed the case. When all this happened, there was a psychosis of fear here on the coast. Women were afraid of going out in the evenings. If they had to go out or when they finished working in the evening, men were asked to join them, to protect them. Making matters worse, these were politically troubled times in Poland. A revolution was brewing and for the government and their communist police force or militia, catching a killer was a low priority. Andrzej Gavrysh was a detective with the unit in Gdansk that eventually caught Tuklin. This was not the greatest time in the history of Poland. The authorities weren't too bothered to reveal that a criminal was prowling in our area. The preoccupation with political dissidents allowed Tuklin free reign for eight years. In that time, he sexually assaulted and murdered nine women and attacked another 11 who survived. I think Tuklin got used to getting away with it. There was something in him. He was a loner, he was an ordinary man who seemed to be able to get away with attacking women almost at will because he was quite careful. He chose isolated spots, rural communities, where there was no one to see him. This killer's story begins some 70 years ago 
Pavel Tuklin was born on the 28th of April 1946 in the village of Gura, some 40 miles from Gdansk. There were 11 children in the family. Pavel Tuklin was the eighth. Tuklin is born in a rural community in Poland, fairly isolated. The parents, Bernard and Monica, are farmers, and it's a fairly disciplined household. The father is violent, often drunk. As a child, Tuklin would wet the bed. There were times when his father beat him for wetting the bed. This problem was never taken care of. Violence filled Tuklin's childhood. His parents were farmers. There was quite a lot of violence in the household. Violence was part and parcel of, of everyday life. Growing up, he's learning that, that violence is a way of getting things done, that controlling people, that having authority over them is achieved through being physically harmful towards them. Tuklin's bedwetting continued into his teens with devastating consequences. Pavel wet himself. It led to the problems with making connections with his peers. The kids at school called him a stinker, a firefighter or a pisser. He was an object of ridicule in the classroom. He wet himself up until he was 18 years old. He was not accepted by his peers, not to mention the girls. He smells quite strongly of urine. The other kids aren't going to want to hang around with him. They're going to make fun of him. So everywhere he goes, he's isolated. And he's somebody who is increasingly going towards the margins. Tuklin had problems forming relationships with women. He was intimidated by them, probably from a very early age. He found women too frightening to really interconnect with. As a teen, Tuklin became a voyeur. He starts engaging in a behaviour known as scoptophilia, or voyeurism. So he gets pleasure, he gets sexual gratification through, through watching women through their windows. And this makes him feel quite powerful. Aged 18, Tuklin moved from his village to the suburbs of Gdansk and got a job working in construction. He wants to start afresh in a city where nobody knows him. And he seems to achieve this for, for at least a short period of time. So he meets a woman, they get married, they have a baby. It was quickly apparent to his wife, and then probably pretty apparent to him, that this wasn't going to work. The marriage was going to collapse. Indeed, it did. It ended in divorce in 1973. After the separation from his wife, Tuklin retreated into his own world, one filled with deviant fantasies that would soon turn deadly. Tuklin's sexual madness evolved gradually. Then exhibitionism was added. Tuklin wandered around Gdansk, and he just exposed himself in front of girls. He often wore a coat and would get his penis out and flash. One of the first times that Tuklin is known to have exposed himself in public was near to the city's medical academy. He would undress, unzip his jacket. One student saw his penis and, hey dude, you have nothing to show, and she started to laugh. In this moment, Tuklin got pissed off. For sure it upset him. That was a moment when he thought, bloody women, I will show you. He's got these urges, he, he wants to, to fulfill them, and the, the only way that he's going to do that is going to be through force. Tuklin decided that to satisfy his urges and avoid rejection, he would have to subdue his next target. He used a hammer and a method he learned as a child on the farm. He hit the women so they wouldn't move. He stunned them, just as he learned to do when he lived in the country, when his father stunned the pigs before he killed them. Tuklin's first known physical attack came when he was 29 years old. On the 31st of October 1975, Tuklin spotted 21-year-old Danusha. The waitress was on her way home after work. 
An investigator who played a key role in the killer's capture, Stanislav Sviak vividly recalls the assault by Tuklin that night. He attacks this girl, smashes her with a hammer, and drags her to the bushes. Suddenly, a witness comes along, a woman. She hears the girl whimpering. He tried to undress her, but he was scared away by the couple that was passing by. So, he says to the woman, I think someone's groaning over there. Something bad must have happened. You stay here and I'll go call the ambulance. He then calmly walks away. The woman fortunately survived. Anusha was really lucky that she was found so quickly. It was the decisive factor for her. The police and ambulance came and they took her to the hospital. She was in critical condition. They managed to save her life. It was only because Tuklin did not stay with her. Tuklin was not caught after his first attack, and more troubling was that his violent fantasy of subduing a woman and sexually molesting her had not been fully satisfied. So two months later, in January, armed with a hammer, he struck again. It's cold, wet, snowing, isolated, and he's literally hunting for prey. The second attack, he hits the woman again on the head with a hammer, and then again is interrupted. So you've got these first two attacks, which are effectively coitus interrupters. The fulfillment hasn't actually happened, and so he's thinking, this must be completed. The woman survived, but was seriously injured by the perverse assault. Four weeks later, on February the 12th, 1976, Tuklin attacked again. His third victim managed to get away too, but not before Tuklin injured and traumatized her. The sexual predator had now developed a modus operandi that was as cruel as it was simple. His MO was quite basic and quite brutal, so he would go out equipped with a hammer, that he would wrap cloth around the top of, not to soften the blow, but to stop his stomach from getting cold when he tucked it down his trousers. His approach with his victims was incredibly direct. Some of them he would walk up to and say, have sex with me. Uh, and clearly, that's not going to be met with, with a, a particularly warm reception. When he was rejected, Tuklin turned violent. He liked to chase his victims. He didn't just want to overcome them straight away. He wanted, I guess you'd call it, the thrill of the chase. It would prolong the pleasure for him and obviously the distress for his victim. Then Tuklin would attack the woman with a hammer. Which, in a way, gave him a perfect MO because that person, from that point on, would not be any trouble, would not scream, would not draw attention, and they would be exactly what he wanted a passive, motionless female that he could sexually gratify himself with. Sometimes he'd, he'd completely obliterate their face. That is often a, a very personal style of, of killing. It's taking away somebody's identity when you're attacking their face in that way. So he probably felt quite resentful towards his victims. Subdued, Tuklin would then sexually assault the women. In his first few attacks, he did not kill his victims. Instead, he left them severely injured and clinging to life. But then, at the end of 1976, Tuklin's attacks on women in and around Gdansk suddenly ceased. That was because Tuklin had been arrested for something very different. His attacking of women comes to stop because he's been imprisoned from 1976 until 1979. He's in jail for theft from his workplace. 
Tushlin was caught stealing tools and served three years. When he was released in the summer of 1979, he got a labouring job. He was in charge of distributing tools at a company that repaired railway rolling stock. With his weapon of choice easily available at the ZNTK factory where he now worked, it was only a matter of time before Tuklin struck again. He doesn't start out as a killer, but the inevitable outcome of that desire is that the, the attacks escalate, and they escalate, obviously, into murder. He was developing into a, a bit of a hunter, a bit of a predator. He came to figure out the, the ways that would be most effective to get what he wanted. So he'd pick locations that were isolated, where, where there wouldn't be other people around. So if somebody comes along and they're a woman and they're on their own, then they're potentially one of his victims. On November the 9th, 1979, Tushlin caught a bus to Leshno, a village about 10 miles outside of Gdansk, where he went out hunting for his next victim. This was not a situation like before when he just wanted to expose himself or masturbate. With a hammer tucked in his belt, he was actively looking for a victim. Irena, a 20-year-old nurse, was walking home when she was spotted by Tuklin. She was walking alone. He was getting closer and closer to her. He already had his penis exposed. She turned towards him, but he just attacked her with a hammer. We're talking about 15 hammer blows to the head. Every one of those is going to lacerate the scalp potentially fracture the skull. By the time you've got through 15 blows, it is going to be quite a horrific sight. There's going to be severe damage. Once he was sure that Irena had been subdued, Tuklin dragged her into some nearby bushes. The girl was still alive. She moved her hands and she tried to bend her legs. These were the unconditioned reflexes after severe damage to her head. Dozens of hammer hits caused the base of her skull to fracture. Tuklin then sexually assaulted the woman while she was still alive. His feelings of power come from making others powerless. And there is no kind of sense of respect for his victims. They are literally just sex dolls for him that just lie there whilst he does what he wants. And, and he doesn't give a damn whether they live or they die. As long as he gets what he wants at that particular given time, then he's happy. When Tuklin was done, he got dressed, wiped the blood off the hammer and walked away. He left this woman lying there in the field. The 20-year-old nurse, Irena, was Tuklin's first murder victim. Irena died at 1 or 2 a.m. She was found next morning. There was no chance anybody could save her. But as Tuklin fled the scene of the crime, he made a major mistake. As he tried to leap over a stream, he dropped the hammer. He suddenly stopped, and then the hammer dropped out of his hand and fell into the water. The police searched the crime scene the next day and soon found the hammer. It was lying in shallow water. Irena's killing could be a breakthrough moment of the investigation. There was a sign on it, ZNTK for the rolling stock maintenance and construction factory. The police interviewed workers at the factory where Tuklin was in charge of handing out the tools. But because Tuklin had stolen the hammer he used in the attack, his name was not on the list of people who checked out hammers that week. So Tuklin slipped through the net, and that would prove costly. In 1980, Pavel Tuklin moved back to the village of Gura in northern Poland, where he was born. 
here, 40 miles from Gdansk, and now living on a farm. The man who had attacked four women with a hammer and killed one was hiding in plain sight. On the surface, 34-year-old Tuklin was living an ordinary life. He even remarried and had a second child. But his wife seemed oblivious to his heinous activities. I think he kept them reasonably well hidden in that he went out you know, during the night and at times when he might not be missed that easily. He explained he had some extra jobs. He said that apart from his regular job, he made extra money working for private individuals. All the while, Tuklin's deadly desires had not abated and, in fact, were growing stronger. It would only be a matter of time before he attacked again. There's always going to be something in the background that is unresolved in him. He's always going to feel that resentment and that, that bitterness towards people who marginalised him growing up. One of the problems where someone engages in this kind of attack on females um, for a sexual purpose is that the repetitive nature becomes a little bit mundane once it's been done a few times to add excitement, to add more kind of stimulation to it. He, those attacks became more and more vicious and more often deadly. On the 1st of February 1980, Tuklin was once again on the hunt when he spotted 30-year-old Anastasia walking home. With a cloth-bound hammer tucked into his trousers, Tuklin approached the young woman. When she rejected his advances, he ruthlessly struck. While his victim lay dying, Tuklin helped himself to all that he wanted. Tuklin actually did after he had managed to gratify himself and rummage through the bags and, and belongings of the victims. He will have taken things, the odd trophy, that he could actually use as, as some kind of reminder of the event itself. But he also almost engaged in a kind of post-sex um, celebratory meal. He would take any food that was left and he would eat it whilst actually watching that female die, bleed, be in agony. Here's somebody who doesn't care about the, the suffering or the pain of other people. He'll take the, the lunch of one of his victims and he'll sit there eating it while she's fighting for her life because it's all about him and his own survival and his own needs and his own desires. Anastasia was Tuklin's second murder victim. In five years, three of which were spent in prison, Tuklin brutally attacked nine women. By the end of 1980, Tuklin had killed a total of six women and was about to murder many more. On the map, you can see the spread of the crimes. In the beginning, when Pavel Tuklin lived with his first wife in Gdansk, he attacked in the suburbs of the city. After 1980, when he moved to Gura, the attacks were there. He moved by bus, by train, or by stolen car. And the following attacks in these towns were along the car route. With the communist government preoccupied with the uprising that had begun in September 1980, and led by the labor union known as Solidarność, few resources were allocated to murder investigations. That meant Tuklin was able to strike with impunity. In all, he would kill nine women before he could be caught. It was a big embarrassment for the police to admit that there was a serial killer in the communist country. The serial killers could exist in the USA, in the UK, or in the rotten West, as Western Europe was called back then. Not in a beautiful communist country like Poland. But when, on December the 8th, 1982, Tuklin attacked a woman next to the local Communist Party headquarters, everything changed. There was a big fog on that day. The temperature in Skarsheva was approximately zero, and the town was surrounded by a fog so thick 
that there was no visibility. In what were perfect conditions for the sexual predator, Tuklin saw 26-year-old Bojena, a local factory worker, walking home alone. He saw she was petite. Bojena was a slight woman. When he was close, he simply attacked her. After he hit her in the head with the hammer and knocked her out, Tushlin dragged her to some nearby bushes where he continued his attack. But Bojena was still alive. Residents in an apartment complex nearby later reported hearing her cries for help. The residents heard the voice, Mum, Mummy, the voice of a girl, some moans coming from the bushes. But no one really knew what was going on. Tuklin started to undress Bojena. In the meantime, she woke up several times, said something, started begging for help. He hit her with a hammer again. After the first hit, Bojena woke up at least twice, as he described it later. When he was done satisfying himself, Tuklin left the fatally injured Bojena to die. But this time he made a mistake that would eventually put an end to his serial killing spree. As the murder happened next door to the local Communist Party headquarters, the mass murders could no longer be ignored by the regime. Bojena died next to the headquarters of the ruling Communist Party. That fact put huge pressure on the authorities. They wanted to solve this case somehow. In January 1983, a new police task force was set up to find the serial killer. At that point, Tuklin had attacked 16 women with a hammer. Called Scorpion, the team was so named for the way Tuklin struck his victims. It's kind of appropriate, the idea of the sudden striking motion that you're not expecting. You can imagine a scorpion moving like that. One of the commanders of the special unit was Stanislav Shek. Our group had the support of the whole police force in the entire area. In fact, the information connected with this case was flooding in from different directions. After matching murders committed in the same way, the task force quickly worked out they were dealing with one serial killer and sexual predator. A key detective on the Scorpion team was Andrzej Gavrish. In terms of those first pieces of evidence, we can say that on those specific crime scenes, similar tools seem to be used to attack the victims. People who worked on those cases had a stronger and stronger belief that all these murders were committed by one person. The hunt for the so-called scorpion killer was now on. I think he would have been well aware of the, the coverage of these crimes and, and the fact that he was branded the scorpion. Here's somebody who's been marginalised and isolated and excluded their, their entire lives, and, and now they're this pseudo-celebrity. Now everybody is talking about them. And I think that would have made him feel quite powerful. With the task force fully engaged in stopping the scorpion, the net was closing in on the serial killer. Pavel Tuklin was living on the family farm in the village of Gura, some 40 miles from Gdansk in Poland. He had so far attacked 16 women and killed eight using a hammer. But he was about to make a mistake that would lead to his capture. On the 28th of February, Tuklin stole a van and was driving near the small town of Lubihovo when he spotted some piglets at a local farm. 
Tuchlin saw there were some piglets in the pigsty. He drove to the back, loaded the piglets and arrived home unnoticed. He told his wife he got the piglets for a job he did instead of money. He put the piglets into the pigsty, built a fence, spent some time at home and then went hunting again. Tuklin's criminality, be it theft, murder or sexual assault, now consumed his life. He wasn't just a, a sexual predator, he was a thief. He stole a van and as he was driving the van, he sees a woman walking along the road and I think he sees an opportunity there and he decides, right, well, I want her. Early the next morning on March the 1st, Tuklin had his next victim in his sights. 25-year-old Suava was an accountant and was getting ready to go to work at the local state collective farm. When she left her house, Tuklin followed her in his van. Then, when he was sure no one was around, he sped up. When Tuklin saw a woman walking along the side of the road, he sharply pulled over and hit her. She lost consciousness. Tuklin put her in the back of the van and drove to some secluded woods nearby. There, he took a hammer and began striking her. He left her completely annihilated. And then everything does start to unravel, because he's changed his MO. This isn't the, the usual hammer attack that he uses. And I think at this point in time, he feels like he's pretty invincible. Nobody's caught up with him yet. But as Tuklin was trying to drive away, the van got stuck in the mud. Tuklin then decided to assault the woman. He got her out of the van and viciously attacked her. When he was done, Tuklin left his victim, Viaswava, to die in the field while he abandoned the van and left for home. Viaswava was really lucky. She survived despite being hit with a hammer. Though seriously injured, Viaswava was able to give the police who were called to the scene a description of the man who attacked her. At the same time, the police found pig feces in the back of the abandoned van. With that evidence, they determined the attacker must have been from the country and not the city. But the biggest clue that would lead the Scorpion task force to capture the killer was the fact that he could drive. In the 1980s, being able to drive in Poland was still a rarity. Commander Stanislav Szyek himself searched through the records of people in the area with a driver's license. I remember it like it was yesterday. We requested the records of all people who had a driving license from the areas in which he attacked and murdered people. We asked for people between ages 25 and 40. Then Stanislav cross-checked the list of people with a driver's license against the records of known criminals. It was a list of crimes committed by a man named Paweł Tuchlin. There was something about thefts. He stole some things. When the detective requested a mugshot and compared it to the eight photo fit sketches given by some of the survivors, Stanislav had his eureka moment. When I saw it, when I saw what he looked like, it was a dream come true. It was a compilation of all the photo fits we already had from the witness testimonies. Well, this information, joined by the fact he had a license, gave me the shivers. What is more, from the driver's license records, the investigators found Tuklin's home address. But before the Scorpion task force could get their man, Tuklin struck again. On the 6th of May 1983, Yolanta, a 19-year-old seamstress, was on her way home. Tuklin approached her, and when she refused his crude advances, he hit her with a hammer and then sexually assaulted her. Yolanta died from the awful injuries she'd been subjected to. 
she was Tuklin's ninth murder victim. But when Tuklin succumbed once again to petty theft and stole a large pig cooker from the farm next door, the task force closed in. Once he realised who stole the cooker, Tuklin's neighbour called the police. I think at this point in time, he does feel like he can do whatever he likes, that, that the authorities are never going to catch up with him. On the 31st of May 1983, three weeks after his last murder, the police arrived to finally arrest 37-year-old Pavel Tuklin. When we saw Pavel, the four of us were sat in the car and we all thought, it must be him, it must be him. The police approached Tuklin when they already knew he was a murderer. But the cooker was a pretext to arrest him. They handcuffed him, and you don't do this for such a petty crime. They took Tuklin in, and Andrzej led the questioning. The interrogation lasted around four and a half hours. But Pavel stayed calm throughout the whole thing. At first, he didn't want to talk. He said he didn't remember. We were asking him about specific places and specific dates. And step by step, Pavel began to reveal the truth. A leading Polish forensic expert, Adrian Wrocławski, analyzed the case. Following Tuklin's arrest and during the search of his property, where a lot of evidence was secured. The officers found his shoes in the cupboard of his electrical workshop. When they found the murder weapon too, a blood-stained hammer, Tuklin's fate was sealed. Once Tuklin was actually confronted with evidence, he knew the game was up. He knew that he may as well confess. He may as well sort of get it off his chest, if you like, but most of all, probably, um, be able at last to brag about it. Then, in an extraordinary move, the police took Tuklin back to the scenes of his crimes and had him reenact the attacks. He was so excited by these events that during the investigation, he often said he could show more during the reconstructions. And he even asked, as there were legal apprentices there, to get the younger girls so he could demonstrate it better as they turned him on. Not only was he reliving what he'd done, he was also kind of showing off to all these fairly indifferent individuals exactly what he had done. And he was to some degree proud of it because those were his sexual conquests. On the 5th of May 1985, Tuklin's trial for the murder of nine women began at the provincial courthouse in Gdansk. But even though he confessed to it all, in court he pulled a major surprise. Up until then, he pleaded guilty of the charges, as well as actively taking part in the visits to the crime scenes. But after the reading of his indictment, he pleaded not guilty. He said that he was forced to confess, that there was an agreement between him and the militia officers. If he confessed, he would spend three years under observation in a psychiatric unit, but then he would be free to go and enjoy his life. But the jury did not buy his defence. On August the 6th, 1985, Pavel Tuklin was found guilty of nine murders and 11 attempted murders. He was sentenced to death. The number of victims, the amount of suffering and the endless tears that he caused allow us for sure to consider him one of the world's most evil killers. On May the 25th, 1987, nearly 12 years after his first attack, Pavel Tuklin was executed for his crimes. He was sentenced to death by hanging, and as he was being, being led to the end, he really was kicking off. He was giving his guards a very hard time of it. And you often see this with, with killers who are, are given the, the death sentence. They have a, a last vestige of power here. They can control what happens in relation to their death, and he wasn't going to go quietly. 
At the end, this was the last shocking thing. The prosecutor asked him what he would do if he was released. Pavel replied, well, I'd probably go for another hunt. We did this. We worked this case for the memory of these girls who were always on my mind. Thanks to the dedication of the detectives on the case, Tuklin's eight-year reign of terror in and around Gdansk and northern Poland was finally stopped. But the brutality of the crimes, sexually assaulting and killing nine women, and the attempted murder of 11 more makes Pavel Tuklin one of the world's most evil killers. <laughs>